Welcome to APS Stamp Chat. I'm Scott English, Executive Director of the American Philatelic Society. Joining me is Harold Krish with Lessons from Postal History, Mental Health, and Prisoners of War. Stamp Chats are made possible through the support of APS members. To learn more about APS membership, please visit our website at stamps.org. For those watching live, your microphone and camera are disabled during the presentation. You can use the chat section to share with fellow attendees. Please submit your questions in the Q&A box. We will get to all of your questions following the presentation. If you miss any of this presentation, the session is recorded and will be posted on the APS YouTube page. It's my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Harold Krish. Harold resides near Vancouver, Canada, and is a 39-year member of the APS and has been collecting and researching World War I Japanese POW camp postal history for most of that time. He is the executive of the Military Postal History Society and a member of numerous philatelic societies, including the Collectors Club of New York, the International Society of Japanese Philately, the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada, and the 21 Club. Harold presented at the Smithsonian Postal History Symposium in his, his article, the 1919 Ninoshima Camp Exhibition and its postcards, was awarded large gold at Sescal 2020. Harold credits much of his philatelic passion to the mentorship and inspiration provided by Emil Auer and Ludwig Seitz. COVID and international military conflicts have highlighted mental health impacts under adverse conditions. Around the world, people have experienced significant isolation, grief, and impaired communication. We gain unique and interesting insights into those challenges, adversities, and responses to positive interventions through postal history. Through the lens of world, Japanese World War I prisoners of war, Postal History, presenter Harold Krish examines how prisoners of war responded to the mental health and isolation challenges, how effectively they coped and the circumstances that allowed those opportunities to prevail. This program touches on the postal history and methods for research with the postal history and ephemera associated with those camps. Thank you for being with us again, Harold. We're honored to have you. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I also want to extend thanks to the APS for their foresight and vision in sponsoring this kind of program and the education that it supports. And uh, welcome to everybody that's out there. I, I appreciate uh, your attendance. I think that's part of collaboration that is so important in this hobby and makes it strong. I have the uh, uh, pleasure today of sharing with you some of the 40 years of uh, collecting that I've put in for the Japanese World War I POW camp material. But as Scott alluded, I'm, I'm coming at it in a very different way from what I have in the past. I'm, I'm looking at it from the perspective of what can we get out of what we're collecting? What knowledge is there? How do we, how do we probe it further? How do we get more education out of what we're doing as opposed to the traditional approaches that we've been taken in, in philately? So let me just uh, hit... So the topic that uh, Scott mentions, lessons from postal history, and the focus that I've decided to take and share with you is what can we learn from postal history that ties in and supports our thinking and knowledge on things that are currently affecting our society? And I, I, can, I don't have to probe too deep, but we can get into some of the challenges that our societies face especially over the last four or five years, when you look at things like COVID, the impacts that are inherent upon society, especially from a wellness perspective, and certainly from a mental health perspective. So the question is around, what are these impacts? How, how are they shaping our society? What are, they, what are they doing to push us into different directions? How are we responding to that? And whether it's the, you know, something like the coronavirus or whether it's some of the tragic um, military situations that have impacted societies and, and whether it's in the Middle East or whether it's in the Ukraine, the impacts there have been considerable, not just in those regions, but for all of us, it doesn't matter where we are. So I use some of those questions to come back at my topic and raise the question of what 
what do these POWs do in the Japanese camps of World War I to deal with wellness? How do they focus on maintaining their mental health status where it needs to be? And so I generated a series of, of thoughts and questions, and those resulted in me looking at my collection to say, hey, what, what do I have as examples of the responsiveness that can be found in those camps? And here are some of the thoughts and considerations that I put forward with that thinking. A couple of things jumped out at me, the meaningful use of time, especially when you're confined. And I think there's some strong parallels there between what we saw and experienced during COVID ourselves. And then I was always also looking for engagement. And engagement is huge when it comes to mental health. How's that being promoted? What did that look like and feel like? What examples do I have in my collection that can help me understand what was going on better? Before I jump into sharing some of those examples with you, I really should give you just enough context so you can understand what I'm talking about and when this happened. So uh, give me a couple of moments here to share a little bit of brief background. The um, Areas that we're talking about, obviously, are Japan, World War I, 1914 to 1920, uh, duration of time in those POW camps. But it, uh, this really starts with the people in those camps were um, primarily Austrians, mostly Germans, who were in the Crown Col uh, Colony of Kia Chow that was located on the east coast of China. It's this area on this uh, postcard map that is shown there, the Shantung Peninsula, and then this leasehold territory. So that's kind of this, the, the sort of the root of the setting. Other things that were happening at the time that are important to, for us to understand were the learnings that were being exhibited already by the conventions of war or related to war. So I, I've just cited the Hague Convention of 1899 and then 1907, those are the prime ones. And these, you know, I've taken a quote right from one of the conventions. It's considered as embodying the rules of customary international law that extended to all countries and were deemed to be binding. And, and it was about communication. How do you let people know that somebody's a prisoner and how do you treat them? Why, why should you be treating them that way? Those types of discussions came from that. Another important aspect of what was happening for Japan in World War I is the, the Japanese government was quite concerned that they needed to be seen as international players on the international stage. And they felt one way of doing that and demonstrating that was to come right out and be able to participate with the big players, the, the countries in Europe. And so Japan during World War I was an ally of the French, the British. And Part of their approach was, we need to demonstrate that we can follow all international protocols and we're gonna do it better than expectations. And one of the directives that came out to the commanders of the POW camps in Japan was, make sure you treat the prisoners as well as you would expect your own soldiers to be treated. So those are some, some lenses that are important to keep in mind as we, as we go forward. Um, I've selected a, a postcard here in the lower left that it's uh, published in 1914 in, out of Europe. It's an Italian postcard. And I picked that just to remind us that Europe had a, a strong presence in China during this time period. And whether it was the British or the French or the Italians or the Germans, uh, that influence is also there. Uh, the Japanese, when they declared war, on Germany in August 23rd, 1914, they were very interested in the Chinese area. And so their immediate focus was on this German crown colony of Kia Chow. And they, along with a smaller British force, ended up setting up a blockade. Uh, it was November 7th, 1914. So still very early in the war when they already successfully had the, uh, the third German sea battalion surrender. And then those prisoners, about 4,700 of them, ended up being taken back into Japan. 
The map on the right hand side is actually a, a map that I was able to acquire from the collection of Willie Forst. And you can see his name down on the low, lower left, this map he produced in 1947, showing the main POW camps in Japan. Willie was a, a prisoner in the Nagoya camp, but he was also a collector of this material. And he won uh, an international large gold medal in Hamburg in 1954 with his collection. This was page two out of his collection. The POW camps in Japan, they were all in the southern part of Japan. So pretty much everything was south of Tokyo. Um, Kyushu, Shikoko, and the southern part of Honshu were the locations of the, of the camps. So that, that sets a little bit of our background and context. When I went about approaching the, the questions that I raised about wellness and mental health earlier, my first starting point was actually a book uh, that's illustrated here. It was put, to, put together uh, by Willie Muttelze, who was a fairly well-renowned artist, very talented, and he would always be sketching wherever he was in the camp and, and had hundreds of sketches. Some of these sketches were incorporated into this book, which was called Four and a Half Years Behind Barbed Wire. And I thought this would be a great place for me to start and see how he's approached looking at camp life. And sure enough, one of the very first entries he has in his book is this sketch that is uh, in German titled Stillleben, which means inactive living. And he shows three different aspects of inactive living. So you've got somebody uh, diligently practicing the, uh, the violin there. It looks like somebody else is doing some reading, perhaps even writing in a diary. And then, of course, there's a bit of a social inactive component there with some card playing that's happening. And I thought, that's not a bad way to come at this. So I also decided to take a look at my material and start with the focus on inactive living. And what better place to start than sleep, because it's probably 25 to 30% of time that people spent in the camp. So here's a, a postcard that I pulled out. Uh, it is from the Matsuyama camp, um, and the camp seal is shown on the back of the card right here, the large oval violet strike. You quickly get a feel for the crowded conditions with the crowded sleeping conditions there. And you start thinking about the implications of that quality of rest you're getting, but also the potential impacts where you do have colds or flus or diseases that are uh, running rampant through a camp and what the implications might be. This is uh, real photo postcards from the Japanese camps are tough to find. You don't see them very frequently. So this is an interesting card uh, because it captures the sleep. And I think I've only ever seen two cards that cover that domain. Uh, the fella here, second from the right, appears to be awake. I think his eyes are open. He also is the person who wrote this card. So uh, Heinz uh, Stigfield has written this card back uh, to relations in Hamburg, Germany. And uh, the card was sent in. Um, March of 1917, you can see it's got a hand stamp for Easter greetings. Another uh, of the inactive components of lifestyle in the camps revolved around writing. And often people would keep some diaries and they weren't always extensive. This is a good example where uh, Conrad Lochman, this is a diary I was able to acquire many years ago. Uh, if you take a look at his entries there, they're not daily, they're not extensive, but he does capture some key elements of what he's experiencing and what he's feeling. And just that ability to think, to engage, and the writing process was obviously quite important for many of the POWs. Here are a couple, couple of more uh, photographs. Uh, the real photo postcard that's shown on the right hand side here conveys the importance of being outside and that's something I'm going to ask you to look for throughout the presentation as well how many of the images that I'm sharing with you are outside in the camp where they're getting fresh air even even when it came to playing cards and card playing was a very important pastime I found information 
whereby POWs in their letters home are writing about uh, their team victories in card tournaments. The uh, image shown on the left side is an interesting one because you've got a serious card game happening. Uh, card victories were often scored and tallied and kept, and this game's featuring quite the stare down between Lieutenant Kuhn and uh, a person he's playing against who's laid his cards right down on the table. But it appears to be a pretty intense matchup of cards there. Uh, games were um, valued highly. Any opportunities to acquire, whether it was cards or in this case, chess pieces. Chess was a very, a very passionate, uh, engaging game in many of the camps. This particular uh, game that's going on here, uh, it's a real photo postcard again. It's outside. Matsuyama camp, and you've got eight people watching this particular game. So the interest level, especially between key players, often very high. Often the games were um, recorded and reported in some of the camp newspapers that happened in the Matsuyama and the Bando camps. Here's another uh, image of a chess match. This one was in the uh, Ninoshima camp, and the, the fella on the right, um, you can um, point his name out because he's a prominent chess player, organized some of the tournaments, but was also a, an artist. And he was a person who ended up designing a number of the camp postcards, especially a couple of postcards for the 1919 Ninoshima exhibition that happened. So people had different interests. They were exploring many of them. And when you look into these individuals, you often find that they, their, their talents and richness was shared in many different ways. Here's a, a copy of the Ninoshima chess tournament rules uh, typed out. And then on the back of the rule sheet was a listing of those people who registered for this particular competition. So things were well organized, um, well supported, and there was good variety out there. Uh, learning time was highly valued, and it was very formal at times, too, in terms of organized times where people could study and learn and work together. So here you've got an idea, an example again, and you notice that this is outside again, a couple of desks there, and people are working away. Uh, the postcards, uh, people are talking about their learning as well. They're showing and demonstrating pride in the information that they're accruing. And when you have 4,700 POWs, you're gonna have a range of competencies, a range of interests and some outstanding expertise that people are able to share. So the educational piece was, was very significant within most of these camps. It was uh, seldom individually or with individual focus. So this is a, this is a classic situation where you've got group learning that's taking place. People are working in groups and teams. This was often the case in particular for some of the bigger camps like the Bando camp. Here's another uh, a, a great photo postcard where Chinese language instruction is happening. And you, you've got uh, two officers uh, and one Marine working there with, uh, with another, uh, another Marine. And um, you've got the Chinese uh, script in the background, uh, 1915, so this is fairly early, but again, it's a collective learning focus that promotes engagement. Uh, this card again, coming out of the Matsu uh, Yama camp. One important component of our understanding and, and learning are elements of ephemera. And I was fortunate, to, I have a number of postcards from the Ninoshima exhibition in 1919, but I was also able to acquire the program for that exhibition. Uh, as you can see there, it, um, it talks about on page 18, there's quite a section there on the educational programs. And there were a bunch of educational displays that were put on exhibit. Well, 73% of the POWs in Ninoshima were involved in educational, formal educational programs. 
Uh, that's over 400 POWs. 47 different course offerings were identified and listed. 46 different teachers. Class size is up to 52. So you had significant group, group efforts that were happening in, in rooms that became mini theaters. And an incredible range of educational offerings that some of them certainly surprised me and, and especially in the, the love, level of expertise that was being shared. One of the things we encountered, I think, during COVID was the uh, quick realization that if you were looking for pets, it was hard to find them because they were all being snapped up. People were at home, they couldn't get out there, and they valued engagement of any type, especially with pets. Well, it was no different in the POW camps. Most camps had a number of pets. Many had a diverse range of pets. And I didn't even realize on this, this card uh, initially, until I went back to look at the collection to put this presentation together, that this wasn't just a puppy on this person's lap. When I look closer, as you can see in the, the blow up in the middle here, this is a puppy resting on a monkey on this person's lap. Um, I have some, some of the postcards um, talked about the importance of pets, uh, the uh, focus on, on training the dogs that were in the camp. So again, it's about uh, connectiveness, engagement, um, making use of your time in meaningful ways, and then sharing that with, with colleagues as well. The uh, card on the left is from the Matsuyama camp. The photograph on the right is for, from the Karume camp. And what I wanted to point out to you here is that uh, quite a few of the photographs and the postcards that you're going to be seeing, when you take a careful look at the background, you'll notice there's quite a bit of evidence that people are spending some time on aspects of gardening, whether it's flowers, whether it's um, decorative, and then also even the whole approach towards raising vegetables. Uh, I've got some letters from POWs uh, that are sent back home to Germany that are requesting relatives to send them particular seeds for the, for the gardens that were being established. Again, time being spent with colleagues in a meaningful, purposeful way. Uh, even when it comes to weeding, uh, <laughs> And I'm not sure that one person there looks like he might just be supervising, but it was part of the engagement process that gave meaning. This particular uh, real photo postcard is uh, Herman Hake, and it's in his um, living quarters. This is the common area of his living quarter. And I wanted to share this with you because it gives an indication of uh, even though you're isolated away from family, thousands of kilometers from home, haven't seen them for years, there's still elements of pride that are evident in their, in their local dorm setup there. You've got pictures mounted on the wall. Uh, you've got a, a, a tablecloth that's there. And uh, there's an element of tidiness to the, to the place and upkeep is evident. Um, the Postal cards that I've been sharing with you, the ones that are used here, the, the marks are all fairly common. You've usually got some type of uh, camp seal. Again, this is the Matsuyama camp seal. There is an indication that uh, some type of censorship has been applied here. This one, you can see there's a small square orange in the background. That would have been the censored chop. Uh, the hand stamp in red is the service de prisoner de guerre. The, the rectangle that's boxed here is a directional marking indicating that this piece of mail is being sent to Germany. So those are fairly common markings on the back of all of these cards. And you've got to have fun, even during those difficult times. And so I did run across a couple of, um, th this card in particular, very different from the norm. I only have two of this type, but it, it's an indication that the POWs at times, they were making efforts to have fun with each other in, in ways that you might not expect. And that also needs the support 
from those people who are the commanders of the camps as well. Um, three of the officers enjoying a beverage. And the reason that I've shared this particular um, card is that it emphasizes the importance and value that was still given to elements of tradition. Uh, the, the traditions from the homeland, and that especially included holidays. So for Pentecost here, Pinkston, uh, 1916, uh, this is their celebration on that day. They're getting together, they're in their formal attire while doing so. And uh, that, that's a really important part of who we are as individuals, who we are as societies. And it's, they're definitely representing that in many different ways. Uh, this is from the Osaka camp, where again, you've got the aspects of still having some enjoyment and fun with the uh, snow people that are shown in the photograph on the left-hand side there. And then you also have the Christmas celebration. So Christmas 1916, outdoors uh, at night, and the Christmas tree there, um, I have two other pictures of this same scene, uh, one during the daytime. Those are all uh, candles that have been attached to the tree and the formal celebration happened that evening. There was actually a bit of a program in place that also involved the singing of, of Christmas carols and Christmas songs. So a strong effort again to ensure that cultural traditions are maintained. They're still hanging on to and, and, and engaging and prompting and supporting those celebrations as they always would. Uh, again, elements of fun also decided to share with you some of the postcards that were um, produced by the Japanese with Japanese inscriptions. But this was uh, at the Nagoya camp where they had a policy of literally taking the POWs out on some daily field excursions. And this was actually supposed to be a visit to a local temple and it had snowed overnight. And what, what erupted right after their visit was a massive snowball fight. And that's not something that you would necessarily imagine that would be taking place in a World War I POW camp, but it's a reflection on what they were doing to maintain bonds, connections, um, and, and engagement. Uh, the Kurume camp is also known for doing an outstanding job of uh, getting their POWs out into the environment, uh, making sure that there's opportunities to explore some of the local sites, to get down to the river for some uh, some bathing to to get out on the hiking trails that were there, including uh, some of the ones that took them up into the mountains and hills. So I've shared a couple of um, postcards that were produced uh, in in the Karume area that show the the POWs out and about outside the camp. There's the the card on the right. There shows uh, what looks to maybe even be a couple of hundred. POWs out on a significant walk and a day excursion. And, and these, uh, these efforts were highly valued by the POWs themselves. And they often commented on these opportunities when writing back home to their families or their brothers or sisters. And I think that's, that's an important thing to be able to convey when you're in this type of situation as well. This is a, an interesting postcard. And the image, the, 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 the real photo that's taken here is also talked about in the card itself. So this was a, a, a memorial uh, for fellow soldiers who had died both in the camp and, and prior to, to being sent there. Uh, a couple of the people who were experts in masonry created this in the camp. They appro approached the camp uh, commander and said, we'd like to set up a memorial. We'd like to do it near the pond. We Here's our plan. They had drawings done up and this was completed. And, and this particular person writing the card, uh, it, it, you know, to his, to his wife is, is really saying, hey, here's what's going on. This is the, on the other side is the picture of the memorial that we've created here at the camp that honors our, our comrades that were fallen. Uh, this particular card coming from the Bando camp. The stone masonry, uh, some of those efforts were taken outside of the camps into the local communities as well. 
Uh, this is a, a was part of a two year project to build some stone uh, walkways across a small um, pond and lake system that was outside the camp and uh, was commemorated with a special plaque. But there were teams of POWs that were involved in doing this and willingly contributed their skill sets to doing something that was also going to be evident in the in the local community for the Japanese. Some of my favorite uh, postcards, not, not just in the Japanese POW domain that I collect, but I, I'm so impressed sometimes with the, uh, the, the imagery, the colors, the vividness of design, the focus points, uh, especially for World War I. And this comes about because there were a, a contingent of printers who were working in the German colony of Kia Chow for the 3rd C Battalion. And they obviously were part of the POWs. And so they used their printing skills to build printing presses within the camps. These were run by the POWs. The POWs designed postcards themselves and they were printed by the printers. The, the printing was of a phenomenal scope and scale, especially in camps like Bando. And uh, Kurume and Ninoshima had excellent printers there as well. And uh, quite amazing in terms of uh, what they were able to produce. Uh, how printing was valued. This is a, a, an advertisement that came out of the Ninoshima uh, exhibition program. And it was put in there by Rudolf uh, Schultz, who describes himself as being an architect. And that was his original profession. But he was also a printer in Kia Chow. And he became one of the main printers in Osaka and then in the Ninoshima camp as well. And he, he used the stone uh, litho process and he advertised his services. He encouraged people to come to him if they wanted anything printed. In the Bando camp, you had newspapers that were being produced with, inside the camp, like being printed on camp printing presses by POWs that were color, uh, that contained some vibrancy and had substance to them. So 24 pages in length. Uh, this is one of, this uh, photograph came out of a, uh, a souvenir album of a POW and it's probably one of my favorite photos, uh, unconventional again, but it, it gets at the skill sets that were inherent in, in the POWs that were there and the fact that they were being tapped into and they were given access to the food domain. In, in fact, in the, Karum, in the Karume camp, they actually had food competitions amongst these chefs and there was tasting and rating of the foods and awards uh, that were handed out. Uh, this is kind of a, I, I find it to be kind of a fun picture because you've got a, a couple of the uh, uh, swine heads there uh, with cigarettes hanging from them and uh, the, uh, the the chefs involved the cooks involved there are all clearly known by everybody in the camp they're well known and renowned their names are plastered on there and uh, they brought German specialty foods into the camp but they also encourage people to raise the type of vegetables that would go with them and support the type of foods that they were like wanting to, to create and produce. Uh, there were even publications of recipes that came forth from some of these POWs. So the, it, it, this speaks again to that level of engagement and the support that these activities were getting. Uh, entertainment was also hugely popular. Uh, here's just a couple of tickets. Uh, the one on the left is it's actually field hockey, but it's a ticket that Fritz Violet uh, purchased. They sometimes charge for these. So you can see the, the two yen uh, purchase price there for this ticket back on May 9th in 1917. Uh, those funds were then used to help support uh, some of the activities that were being run and the, the types of activities and the scope and breadth of them. The ticket on the right is for uh, theater. Theater was huge in the camps. Uh, and as you know, they've, they've got these tickets right down to a seat number. 
So again, excellent organization. And as we know, organization takes a lot of work and energy and coordination. So it gives us an idea of how engaged these many of these POWs were. Uh, they even got into the, you know, the entertainment that pushed comedy to the forefront. Uh, you need laughs. So whether you're whether you're dealing with, uh, you know, the isolation, the anxiety that something like COVID brings, or whether you're in a POW camp, you need to be able to let loose and have some fun. And and to to encourage that, you've got uh, people stepping up and and getting involved in some interesting ways. Uh, Carl uh, Schlosser was well renowned in the Osaka camp for um, his way out there comedy. And he did that in a combination of entertainment with the clown outfit, but also performance. He, he was a musician as well, and also involved in theater. This is, a, a, again, a very interesting document that speaks to me about the connectedness that happens when you're working hard to stay engaged and you're in a POW camp or isolated. Uh, this is a, a remembrance photo that was taken just before um, they were going to be repatriated from the Karume camp. This is the entire theater group and they've all signed it at the bottom. And again, I think that speaks well to the degree of support that was available, but also the support that was allowed by the camp commanders. They must have certainly had an understanding of if you've got people who are feeling okay about what's happening and, and meaningful engagement is allowed, probably going to be easier to deal with those people as well. And again, this goes back to speaking a little bit to fun. Where would you imagine seeing eight guys on bicycles that are decorated and that do some trick stunts and that to entertain at events, whether it's sporting events like soccer matches. And again, these images are now being represented on uh, local Japanese produced cards. Uh, the picture on the right side also gets at the more of the entertainment and in this particular case the uh, music that was also very prevalent uh, the group here uh, is from the it's the music group from the anagahara camp uh, again there's a number this is one of the areas where there are a fair number of real photo cards showing the the musical groups here's a, a string practice session in the karume camp um, the Karume uh, band on the left and the uh, Osaka band shown on the postcard on the right. You'll notice that definitely there's a bit of emphasis on strings, uh, easier instruments, I guess, to design and acquire in the camps. But you will notice that there are some, some horns that are visible in some of the pictures. And you'll notice even the uh, accordion in the Osaka camp there in the, in the center as well. Uh, this is the uh, Shizuoka string practice session. Uh, again, you notice it's happening outdoors. And one of the things that was common with some of these cards, you'll notice this card was actually sent by a member of the, the string group here. He's put a little X on his shoulder to indicate that he's in the picture. There is, and he's referencing that in the text as well. He's sending this card. This is an intercamp card. So it's going from Shizuoka to the Ninoshima camp. And this person here happens to be involved in the band in Ninoshima. So there's even a connectedness from POW camp to POW camp. I started, uh, this got me doing a closer look and analysis of the type of correspondence that the POWs were having. About 30 to 35% of the correspondence was from POWs from one camp to POWs in another. Again, that reflects on the bonds that existed probably prior to the war already, but certainly are cemented by being POWs behind barbed wire and isolated. Spoke a little bit about the music end of things. Uh, Bando Camp is probably the most famous in terms of its orchestra. Uh, first place that Beethoven's uh, Ninth Symphony was played in Japan. That's had a, a lot of press. Uh, it's been in some movies as well. The performances, as I said before, very well organized, ticket sales, and excellent programs. 
the programs with color, uh, an entire list of people participating, uh, the program laid out in the inside. Some of these programs were six to eight pages in length. And choir, so music in all domains. Um, even um, I, I found a, a diary that was extremely interesting. I probably should have shared a page or two of it, but there was a, a fella who decided he was a piano player and he decided he wanted to build a grand piano. Took him over two years to do it. This was in the Hameji camp, but he was successful in pulling it off. Ended up getting all kinds of support for pieces that were required to construct it. But those were the lengths that people went to. And again, just want to point out again, I mentioned earlier that some on some of these real photo postcards, the sender would put a little X to mark who they were and then reference that. That's been done again on this card from the Osaka camp. Uh, this is a photograph I just wanted to share with you to give you an idea of the extent of support that all POWs put forward for all of these efforts. And whether it was uh, sport matches or, or theater or music. This is the uh, Kurume um, concert hall, so to speak. It's really in the courtyard. And you see the barracks on the right side, barracks on the left side, and then a chair set up. And again, you notice there people are all in their formal whites for these types of performances as well. And what I'd like to do now is to uh, shift over to more of the physical domain of engagement. And you can see right away in this particular postcard from the Karoom camp, there's all kinds of activities going on. So you've got sporting events, uh, track and field was huge. Uh, wrestling was prominent, boxing was prominent, soccer was prominent, stickball and field hockey. Uh, lots of lots of activities done very formally, including things like tennis. One of the most popular was gymnastics. Most camps had had significant teams. Here's a classic example from the Anagahara camp. Um, completely outfitted, uh, lots of practice. So, you know, there are daily practice sessions that were scheduled for some of these teams, and that takes up the time that was there. Again, you'll notice in this this particular card. It's an intercamp card. So it's it's mailed from somebody out of the Anogahara camp, who happens to be in this gymnastics group, to somebody in the Karume camp. Both camp seals struck on the postcard, uh, sent postage free because it was POW mail and with the censorship markings on it as well. Gymnastics took all comprehensive forms. So it's it's not it's not just the simple stuff. You've got the parallel ball bars there. You've got the 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 horse in the background, the pummel horse that's there, and again a ticket with an entry fee for performances. On the left, the Karoom uh, courtyard. That's the same courtyard you saw a few moments ago, where all the people were dressed in the formal whites watching the concert performance. Now it's uh, got gymnastics taking place. And if you look carefully, you notice it also doubles as a tennis court because you can pick up the tennis lines in the foreground of that picture on the left. One of the things that was uh, had amazed me on some of the real photo postcards was the gymnastics and the extent it went into the acrobatic side of the gymnastics. The extent of practice and even some of the letters that I have from the POWs describe the intricate nature of designing the acrobatics and then practicing it. And as you can tell there, it's like it's extensive and they rarely went to town on it and worked on it. Uh, here's a great example from the Narashino camp. Something else that I noticed in the materials that I have is recognition of accomplishments and what I call stick to itness. So there were cards like this that were printed by the camp printers that acknowledged, you know, the months of participation that a person had. So if you put in eight or more uh, practice sessions that qualified for recognition that you've completed a, a significant component of a month and you, you get a little hand stamp. Uh, the recognition extended not just from participation, but to performance levels as well including all aspects. Are you a leader? 
the leadership was acknowledged? Did you have outstanding accomplishments and you were given certificates? Uh, 96 points, fourth place overall, and it was very specific. Some of these certificates were hand designed and hand drawn just to be special. You can tell this would take a, a lot of time to complete something like that. The sports activities were also um, underscored with postcards that were created in the camps, especially when they held their Olympics, which they called sport weeks each year. And they usually focused again on particular sports. And these cards were available for the POWs to use and to send home or to send to other comrades in other camps. The card on the left, if you look carefully here, it's hard to pick up originally, but you see a long jumper that's in midair caught in this particular uh, photo. And again, take note of the number of people that are out there watching and supporting those events. Uh, truly extraordinary. Uh, boxing. Uh, here's a poster that I acquired many years back, advertising five, six actually boxing ma matches that were coming up. And scheduled in advance, promoted, uh, a lot of attention. They even give reference to the, the referees and they even make provision down at the bottom of the poster that if the weather is bad, this will happen eight days later. So very carefully uh, designed and put out. Here's a, here's a real photo postcard on the left showing a boxing practice. And then a photograph that I took from a, a diary uh, that captured uh, uh, an actual photo match in a game. Check out how many POWs are out supporting this and watching this. In the Karume camp in 1919, they decided to put together all of the information that they'd collected and they put it into a book. And that book lists every single sporting event and gymnastics event that were, was run in the camp, including participants and results. They're pretty impressive when you think about it. Uh, weightlifting, soccer, uh, is there a sport that wasn't happening is what I start thinking. Uh, even a 50 kilometer um, race walk, complete with, with guards position to, to monitor, lots of variety. Uh, tennis, uh, two different tennis courts existed in the Kurume camp. Uh, the tennis court shown on the right had as many as 300 people watching the championship match in 1918. Here's another example of uh, sport postcards, this one coming from the Nagoya camp. So these things happened in, in not just one camp. These were common activities and occurrences in a majority of the POW camps that I've been talking about. Uh, I, I love this particular postcard because it's soccer. It's a pretty simplistic design uh, Narashino camp, May 1919. Uh, war is over at this point in time. These cards are becoming more prevalent. The activities are becoming more prevalent, probably also because POWs are a little bit more frustrated about war being over and them not being able to get home yet. Another card from that same series from Narashino. This is probably the most famous soccer team that existed in Japan. They were known not just in the POW camps, but in Japanese local communities. Uh, they were well known in Osaka. They were called the Osaka 11. That name was given to them outside of the camp, actually. They played some of the local men's soccer teams and um, were undefeated. At one point, there was a very, very good high school soccer team that had uh, dominated some of the men's teams. And there was a request put out for these guys to play that high school team. Uh, that happened. Uh, the soccer pitch doesn't look all that great, but here's a great photograph showing members of the Osaka 11, along with the high school, senior high school soccer team that they played. And uh, they were successful. It was a five nothing match, but uh, significant community turnout for that match. So you've got engagement extending now into the local community interactions happening with some of the local Japanese as well. Exhibitions were very, very important. Uh, they really picked up sort of 1916, 17, 18, and 1919. Most camps found a way of trying to host an exhibition. Some of these again were shared with the local communities. 
uh, in, and some of them were staggering. The one in, in Ninoshima was actually held in, in uh, Hiroshima at the dome and over 16,000 Japanese people attended over a 10 day period. Uh, these exhibitions gave an opportunity to highlight the skill sets of the POWs and the things that they spent their time on, things they produced, things they made. And as you can see from some of the photographs I'm gonna, and the postcards that I'm gonna share with you in the next minute or two here, uh, lots of interesting stuff being produced, including postcards to advertise these exhibitions. Uh, the postcards, um, this, this is a classic from Bando. They actually also created a hand stamp to acknowledge the exhibition. And you'll notice that the hand stamp was also bilingual. This was a, an exhibition where people, Japanese people from the community were invited to attend it. Some of the products that were being created by the POWs were also being sold at these events to try and help with some fundraising for the journey home and an ability to be more supportive once they arrived back home. Uh, these postcards weren't all produced by the POWs in the camps. Here's a couple of uh, locally produced Japanese postcards as well for the Bando exhibition. Uh, <laughs> the exhibits themselves were amazing because they also featured food, including elements of production from the German bakeries from some of the camps, even alcohol that was being produced in one of the camps. Most of the exhibitions had programs that were developed as well. So you had editors working at putting these together, an extended effort to allow almost anybody to engage and, part and participate. Uh, this particular one, Karum, 1918, it was the third exhibition that they'd run in Karum. 474 exhibits are documented inside this program. Name of the exhibit, the title, what it showed, and the person who created it, whether it was for sale or not, or could be replicated and produced, or you could put orders in, all of that was put in there. There were nine postcards that are also described in this program that were cre created specifically to advertise this particular exhibition. Here's some of the uh, uh, postcards that were produced, again, with hand stamps to acknowledge. So this is the, the third um, Karum exhibition with the special hand stamp for 1918 that was struck. And again, it's an inter-camp card uh, going to Nagoya from the Karum camp. Here's another one of the uh, Karum exhibition cards. And here's some ideas of the types of things that POWs were actually creating. Pretty amazing given the limited quality of the materials that they were able to access or acquire. The performances were recognized, certificates were being issued. Here's a great uh, real photo card that uh, shows the, the main room setup as you entered the Matsuyama camp. Uh, people would walk in and back through these doors into the background here. But this would give you an idea of the types of things that POWs were putting together and doing and making. That's the Ninoshima camp program uh, designed again by a POW, printed by a POW. This was the, pro this was the exhibition that I mentioned had 16,000 Japanese people attend in Hiroshima. Hiroshima. Some additional cards. Uh, and here's a couple of photos again from the Ninoshima exhibition that was held in uh, Hiroshima. Uh, you can see all the, the pieces were uh, numbered so that the 247, the steam engine here, you could find it in the program and it would give you detailed information on it. A couple of examples of uh, advertising in the programs for uh, everything from massage to bakery and they, the bakery that was there had its own advertising sheet shown at the left that they would hand out to the uh, to the Japanese and you'll notice it's bilingual as well. And then I'm going to wrap up here quickly, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about philately. Philately, what a great pastime to have as a POW in a, in a POW camp. And it was there in spades, I surprisingly. So let me start with labels. Uh, you, here's a, a cover from Osaka, and you've got an Osaka label. There were three, 
three different types of labels with a couple of variations that were out there. Originally, these were not to be used on mail going outside the camp, but there are some that made it out there. These are challenging and difficult to find, but uh, this is a, a great example. Um, here you have the two other types of Osaka labels, the round circular hand stamp. Uh, the perforations on some of these labels were originally created by parts out of a watch and a, and a ruler. And so sometimes they're a little bit askew, but uh, certainly contribute in a fascinating, this card here is actually quite an interesting card because it's an inner camp card, but it's going into the um, Hung Home camp in Hong Kong, China. And it's addressed to the Provo Marshal there. Quite an interesting usage. Uh, philatelic stuff as well. Uh, some of the gain, when you look at the addresses, well, this happened to be a person who was a stamp collector. He's probably addressed this to himself when he had an opportunity to get outside the one of the excursions at the local post office, got stamps and got the, the first day cancellations applied to the card as a memento. So there's examples of that type of uh, philatelic work as well that is evident. Um, here's This is an interesting one because this is the 1919 piece set that was issued in Japan. This is a, a, a stationary card that was designed by a POW, printed in the camp, but then had the piece set applied to it and with the first day cancel applied to it as well. And here's the same set. Uh, this time without the first day, well, it is actually a first day cancel, but it's the camp cancel struck in violet on that first day. So people were looking for a variety. Uh, this is probably the most famous uh, Cinderella type item out of the camps, uh, the Bando Logger Post stamps. Uh, most, most people, anybody who's into you know, Cinderella type material will probably be aware of these. Uh, again, these perforations were also originally uh, uh, created from the use of a, a pinwheel that you find in, in, in a large pocket watch. And so you can see they're a little bit askew. These were not supposed to be used outside of the camp at all. And uh, that's why it says Bando Lager Post in the cancellations on them. Again, designed by POWs, strong, vivid color. And in Bando, you also had stationary items. and a significant number of them. Very interesting in terms of the development. Uh, this uh, stationary card had four different color schemes shown on the left. There were actually uh, all kinds of different designs that were imprinted on the reverse side of these cards. And based on the survey work I've done, there are at least 96 different variations of these stationary cards that are out there and there could be more. So people were having some fun with the philatelic end of things. Some of these cards that weren't supposed to be used outside the camp that were for camp use only and even the postcards when they were approved by the camp um, commanders, it says logger postcard, intent for within the camp itself. But a couple of these things were actually mailed and did make it outside the camp and actually were delivered in, in places like Germany and even within Japan. Here's a card that was uh, delivered in Japan. And this is Empfangsbestätigung, uh, which means it's a acknowledgement of receipt card. So this person, this is going to Yokohama uh, and the person's acknowledging that they've received something into the camp and, and putting that out there even wooden postcards. Can you think of the effort that they're going through to do some of these things? And this wooden postcard features uh, another image that was popular for a while, the striding mail deliverer. So painted image, Bando Camp on the one side of the card, the design on the other. Uh, there you have a, a stamp that was created as well, featuring that, that striding post delivery person on a card, Bando Express printed on it and the card with artwork on the reverse. The card on the left was a specimen card, uh, got the S in red down here. 
uh, the camp commander did not wish this card to be used at all. He reminded the uh, POWs that it needed to say lager postcard intended for use only in the camp. But philately was there. It was prominent in, in Bando. It was interesting and people were having fun with it. Local delivery within the camp was possible. You could actually purchase uh, an express delivery to somebody in another barracks if you wish to do that. And uh, this is uh, this is a postcard that I quite enjoy. It's sort of it's got the uh, you know the symbolism, and I, I've written a description here of the two personified chicks conveying an Easter theme. One in traditional Japanese garb, the other in German military attire. They're interacting in, in a casual, relaxed kind of setting. Cigarette as well. The card can be translated as saying, oh, Mr. Spring, this is unfortunately the last Easter we celebrate together. The card inherently is a reminder of the values, the cultural and experiential aspects that fostered respect and positive interactions, despite some of the most challenging times. And as we get later into 1919, you also get the stark reality of what it was like to be a POW. Almost six years in the war, all, more than a year over, and you're still stuck in a POW camp in Japan because you can't get back. The repatriation efforts have been a disaster. So here you've got where we started the whole presentation with Willie Mutlze finishing us off you know, with this great design of his, stark nakedness in the darkness, only illuminated by stars, chained to the floor. This was sent as a Christmas card. Can you imagine the courage that it would take to send something like this to family back home? Can you imagine what it was like for Mrs. Fritz Violet to receive this card from her husband and what she might be wondering? Powerful, impactful. I can't leave you with that stark vision without saying here's two of my favorite Christmas postcards just in terms of design and Im imagery, both produced by POWs print, print, printed in the camp. Um, absolutely delightful uh, and, and very, very impressionable. And where does that leave us? Well, for me, after going through this way of looking at my collection, I had a much better understanding of sense of community. It reminded me of what we should be doing more of today with some of the challenges we face. It educated me further on what happened in the camps that was purposeful. There was an intentionality there with vision. It had some success. It obviously had some downsides too when you see that postcard from Muttlesey and what that depicts and implies. But there was growth and development. There was bonding, there was a sense of team, there was valuing of purpose and traditions where people came from. Engagement was huge. Support for others. They even had programs where if you were older and couldn't participate in some of the sports, they had other opportunities for you to get involved. There was thinking on a broader scale and there was celebration, recognition. You didn't have to win the event. Certificates were issued for participation. The emphasis was on what does it take for respectfulness and well being? Quite powerful. And in some respects, we have a lot of learning to do in today's society. We might benefit from some of the things that we can pick up from the past. So that's where I'd like to leave you. I, I, thank you. I went a few minutes longer than I intended, Scott. So apologies for that. But uh, certainly pleased if there are any questions as well. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation, Harold. And we do have questions. So I want to make sure we get through those. Let me start with a very, let's start with a background question. So the, the, the question came up of how did Germans become POWs of the Japanese? Uh, I think you may have interwoven some of that, but I'd like for you to answer that directly. Sure. Uh, Germany was in China uh, with a crown colony that was leasehold territory. 
It was also the cornerstone of the 3rd C Battalion. And out of uh, Tsing Tsao, you had uh, several thousand Germans that were there. Japan had, uh, for a long while, coveted China and saw this as a natural opportunity. So once, once war broke out in the, in the summer of 1914, it didn't take long for the Japanese to issue an ultimatum to the Germans and then declare war on August 23rd. And again, as I mentioned at the outset, the Japanese were part, parted with the Allied group during World War I. And so the, the smaller British contingents also supported what became a blockade of Kia Chow and the eventual surrender in November of 1914 to the Japanese. And the Japanese elected to take virtually all of the prisoners back to Japan. Uh, only the seriously wounded prisoners were taken by the British into the camp in Hong Kong. Okay. There was another question, and again, I think you may have addressed this a little bit, but I want to take I want you to take it on directly. Uh, were these postcards created by the Japanese and just distributed freely to the soldiers? I think you had indicated that many of them were designed by soldiers and then ultimately approved by the camp commanders. Is that accurate? No, that's correct. Uh, originally, really right at the outset, so in you know November, December, January of, of 1914 into 1915 almost anything that was available for people to write on was being used. And in a number of the camps, uh, local Japanese postcards were being taken and distributed to the POWs. Uh, there were, require there were uh, requirements for writing, so, and there were limitations depending on your rank. So if you were just a regular Marine, you might only be entitled to send four to six items per month, depending on whether that was a postcard or a letter. As things evolved and greater comforts unfolded between the camp commanders and the uh, key officers of the POWs, now you had some emphasis on, on, hey, we'd like to be able to produce some of our own postcards. And that became much more apparent as you get into 19, later 1915, 1916, 17, to the point where you had some amazing postcards being produced. So I have a couple of different questions, and I'll try to merge them together. The portrait of the German POWs in World War I is decidedly different than what we would see in later wars, particularly in World War II and beyond, uh, both by the Japanese and then by other countries as well. Can you explain why life here seemed so much, I hate to use the word normal, but it, it was seemingly more community-oriented than we would see later on? In, in later wars? Uh, certainly a good, great question, Scott, because if you take a look at treatment afforded POWs in World War II and compared to World War I, there's, there's a huge difference. And part of this goes back to a, a, um, one of my introductory comments about where was Japanese government at after uh, the Russo-Japanese War of 1905? And their, their analytics, they were taking a look at things and one of their frustrations for, for the Japanese government was that they were never given any consideration as being key world players. They saw themselves as, as a country that should be on the international stage, but never received credit, never were involved to be part of significant international conversations and discussions. It was always the main group out of, out of Europe. And so they came up with a bit of a game plan saying, hey, we can use World War I as a way to demonstrate that we have an outstanding Navy. We can have an impact. We can be supportive of the Allied group in a significant way. We also want to demonstrate that we're, we're, we're people that understand following rules and regulations. Conventions of war, we're going to follow those to a T. Nobody's going to be able to point a finger at us. And that, that's a bit of a simple simplification, but that in essence was sort of the thinking that evolved to the point where the Japanese government was issuing some direction, including those directions to the camp commanders. Treat these prisoners as you would like to see your own soldiers treated. Don't 
let us find any breaches of the conventions of war. So, and, and as a result, you, you have, and, and were there some issues and problems in some of the camps? Absolutely there were, but for the most part, the commanders were really good. And what also happened and transpired, a couple of the commanders of these camps came out and in talking to their colleagues said, hey, if we are trying to work with these people and be reasonable and respectful, we're not going to face some of the wrath that we might otherwise face either or the issues or problems. And so that was part of the thinking as well. And, and by and large, you had some great circumstances evolving in those camps. And I think just the, the testimony of the materials I've shared, the things that were being produced, the community engagement with the Japanese would be a testament to that. Well, and that's interesting because we did have one question where uh, the one of the viewers dug in a little deeper and said, do you think that there was censorship that may have helped form an image of how German POWs were treated in during the war versus what may have been some reality. That is, some of the unpleasantness may have been protected from the public uh, by censoring some of the mail that left Japan. Yeah, um, censorship was there from the postal authorities. Um, most of that the predominantly seems to be a legitimate focus. There were outsiders, international outsiders that visited these camps as well. And they engaged in conversations with POWs. And, and that, that's, that's how I'm aware of some of the issues that did exist in some of the camps. So, uh, you know, it was a, a group of Swiss uh, delegation that was led by a Swiss person who went in, engaged in, in conversation with the POWs, and some of the issues came to the forefront, which were then discussed with the camp commanders and then were shared publicly and openly. So with those types of efforts, there, there's, it's, your communication is not just limited to POW mail. There are other avenues that also explored what was going on and was able to provide information on that as well out into the field. Okay. I'm gonna end with a much more positive question. And this is one that we often get when we do presentations like this. Uh, and that is specifically about what's your process for finding relevant covers and ephemera that you've used both in your exhibiting and in this presentation tonight. How much time do we have, Scott? Uh, <laughs> that, that's an interesting question. When, when, you're, when you've been at it for 40 years, um, you develop all kinds of mechanisms uh, in terms of seeking out material. Um, I, I've had some amazing scenarios that have come my way. Um, one of which was simply, uh, there's a fellow by the name of Ludwig Seitz, who probably was one of the foremost authorities on World War I Japanese POW mail. I, in the 1990s, I ended up, uh, he lived in Nuremberg in Germany and I ended up interacting with him and we exchanged some correspondence. Uh, he wrote what was still probably today the definitive work in the area and we shared stuff back and forth asking questions um all of a sudden i didn't hear from him and then it was about a year and a half later that i heard that he'd passed away and so i ended up writing a, a letter uh, my, my german's not all that great so i had to go to some extent to translate and send a, a letter in german uh, to his wife and his wife ended up corresponding with me talked a little bit about what should we be doing with the collection that he had and she thought well this would be great for kids at some point that should take up an interest and one of my suggestions was might be nice also to capture this and so she actually took it way beyond what i suggested and she went and had every single item and there was 70 he had 1700 pieces of mail and it's just an amazing collection over about 50 years. She had every piece scanned front and back. And out of courtesy, she ended up sending me, I think it was five CDs that contained all these images, which is just a great resource base. Well, the years go by and the years go by, uh, his wife ends up passing away and I end up having a communication with his granddaughter. 
And uh, two years ago, after a conversation, it was, Harold, nobody in our family wants this stuff. Are you interested in it? So I, I ended up buying his entire collection, probably 20 some odd years after I first interacted with him. And it's not something I thought was gonna happen, but it came across because of the connectedness and some of the collaborative work that you put in. And so I, I'm a strong proponent of collaboration. Uh, once you're out there and you've been collecting for a while, people also will contact you and say, what do you know about this? Or would you be interested in this? And the importance of giving back into the hobby and starting to put out your knowledge, sharing it is really important. So I've written some articles that have been published for, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the Military Postal History Society, the International Society of Japanese Philately. Those articles will sometimes get amazing responses where people get back to you to ask you questions and also say, hey, I've got, you know, 30, 40 items that are from this domain that came through a family member and would you be interested? So lots of different opportunities that are out there uh, once you've been around doing it for a while as well. And you have to know how to research and where to look and you find things in amazing places sometimes. Great answer. And to be honest with you, I always love it when people advocate for sharing their knowledge, that uh, it pays off so many different dividends for the hobby and for the individual that does it. So I know there are a few authors that are uh, joining us for this presentation tonight, and I can't thank them enough and you enough for being willing to share all of this research that you do. This presentation was mind blowing to me. I think this was absolutely one of my favorite presentations so far uh, for seasons one and two of Stamp Chats. I really do appreciate you doing this. And uh, I learned a lot. And I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of benefit that came out of this. So hopefully we can have you back again sometime soon. And I really do appreciate it. Oh, thanks very much for your comments, Scott. It was a pleasure to, again, to share. And it was a pleasure to look at your collection in a very different way and, and give it some different thinking. And that's part of learning too. And, and then you've got application that can be pushed into different directions. So thank you. Well, I'm glad we did this. And for those of you watching, if you missed any part of this, please visit the APS YouTube page to watch the presentation in full and share it with your friends. Uh, remember to like and subscribe to the APS YouTube page for our future stamp chats and other video content. If you're not a member of the APS, my gosh, you should be one. Uh, please do join today and join our stamp community. For more information, visit us at stamps.org. Thanks, everyone, and goodbye.